Thank you very much, Miles, uh, and good morning, everyone. It's Windrush 75, and my mother keeps sending me pictures on WhatsApp of all of her celebrations down in Cardiff. So I thought I'd start with an innovative story of change um, from someone who came on that journey. So when Sir Jeff Palmer came to the UK from Jamaica as a 14-year-old in 1955, he was automatically classed as educationally subnormal. Later, during a university panel interview, he was told by one prominent figure to go back to where you came from and grow bananas. So Jeff's intelligence, application and determination to prove his detractors wrong saw him obtain a PhD in grain science and technology. He became Scotland's first black professor in 1989. And as a scientist, he revolutionised the brewing industry, knocking almost a third off the malting time. So Jeff is hailed as one of the heroes of the brewing industry, and alongside his academic work as Chancellor of Harriet Watt University, he campaigns against racism. He's got a namesake across the other side of the world, Sir Geoffrey Palmer, a former Prime Minister of New Zealand. A constitutional lawyer was in power in the late 1980s when the Labour government there embarked on a radical programme of economic liberalisation. For the first time, the currency was floated, import licences were ended, and the Reserve Bank was given independence from government to set interest rates. Those two Jeffs have played a role in the economic growth of their countries through their innovative ideas. Innovation can come from surprising places. I think that's what was just being discussed, uh, both at the FCA and from the examples I just gave. There's often a fine line between having enough rules or regulation to ensure markets work smoothly and not having so many that you stifle innovation. And the Financial Services and Markets Bill will require us to continue striking that balance by giving us a secondary objective to facilitate the UK's international competitiveness and, and promote sustainable growth over the medium to long term, while continuing to deliver on our primary objectives of market integrity, uh, objectives to protect consumers and competition. Our financial services sector, as you've just been hearing, is critical uh, to the lifeblood of this economy and this country, and the world, actually, and we should be proud of that. It contributes to economic activity, making up around 8% of GDP. It accounts for 2.3 million jobs in the sector and related professional services, and it contributes around £100 billion in tax. Financial services also facilitates economic growth by channeling capital to startups, small businesses, and the largest infrastructure projects, including the vital work of supporting the UK's net zero ambitions. And we recognise at the FCA that achieving sustainable economic growth is a key economic challenge for the country. And serving that will benefit consumers and businesses of all sizes. So we welcome the proposed secondary competitiveness and growth objective, and we stand ready to do our part uh, in contributing to the challenge. We've worked towards this, uh, and we are ready to operationalise it through our regulatory work. Uh, surprising to hear a regulator say these words, but they are genuine. We are excited uh, by this new role, uh, and there are reasons for that. That's because we have already been focusing on aspects of innovation and growth. We were trailblazers in promoting innovation in financial services through our innovation sandboxes and pathways, where startups and fintechs can test new ideas and products with our support. We were one of the first regulators in the world to do this. I think we were the first, actually. Um, and many regulators around the world have mimicked and copied what we've done. But we haven't stood still. We continue to innovate. And I can confirm that our digital sandbox will be made permanent, opening up the platform to an even broader range of innovative businesses and startups. It will include the groundbreaking use of synthetic and transaction, synthetic transaction and market data. Participants in that sandbox will have access to over 200 data assets, including anonymized payments and transactions data, social media data, investment company house, and credit data. The sandbox will pull data from consumers and firms to offer an open API marketplace, providing access to academics, government bodies, venture capitalists, and charities for support and input to digital sandbox participants. 
And we know that that sandbox works. One thing which I always ask my teams is, does, is the outcome that we're seeking to achieve, does it work, do we have any effect? It does. It does foster innovation and growth. We found that nearly six of the 10 previous participants in the pilots experienced positive developments, including launching new products, securing funding and partnerships, or receiving industry awards or recognitions. Both our adoption of innovative regulatory approaches and our work to tackle harm underpin sustainable economic growth and international competitiveness. But however, there is no sustainable growth if credit is unaffordable, if consumers are trapped in cycles of debt and their participation in the wider economy is limited. It's very you know, keenly discussed here in terms of education and participation in financial services. And that's why we intervene to crack down on exploitative, exploitative consumer credit and are working to improve competition in credit information markets. There's also no sustainable growth when insurance doesn't pay out when people expect it to. That can corrode trust in our markets. That's why we intervened during the pandemic to make sure that small businesses got the payouts from their business interruption insurance that they rightly expected um, and deserved. These are just some examples of how our existing primary objectives of consumer protection, market integrity, and competition already drive growth, trust, and good outcomes. Of course, regulation, as we've been hearing, can hinder financial services if the costs of it are disproportionate to the benefits and if it stifles innovation. That is why we have become less prescriptive and more outcomes driven. For example, with the consumer duty, which seeks to ask firms to drive good outcomes for their customers, which as you should know by now, comes into force in one month. However, being less prescriptive does not mean more lax. If we, if we look back, it took five years for UK GDP to return to its 2008 level following the last financial crisis, a crash many attributed to lax regulation, and that undoubtedly hindered growth. So regulation can aid growth by cementing the hard-won reputation of our financial markets as a safe and rewarding place to invest. Resilient, transparent, and efficient UK capital markets foster trust amongst investors, both from the UK and overseas. This ensures our markets can finance the investments into and growth of British businesses and the wider economy. And to do this, the UK needs trusted capital markets operated by trusted financial professionals, like the ones you've been hearing from already this morning, and we will continue to play our role, ensuring that we have safe, stable, and fair markets for efficient, which are efficient and support the flow of capital and investment in the UK's needs. We know that this investment is needed to improve the UK's growth prospects and take advantage of the opportunities of leaving the EU. It's vital that we unlock capital to invest in infrastructure, public goods, and to work towards climate mitigation and climate adaptation. This will require both public and private capital and investment. The numbers are eye-watering, uh, and we are working across the financial industry to support further changes in our regulations to release capital safely and effectively into the real economy. That work includes simplifying our listings regime to ensure raising equity investment in London to, inform, to fund investment and growth is accessible to as many companies as possible, and as Julia has mentioned, to real people uh, up and down the country. We know this is an area of public interest, and we are grateful for the input we've had so far on our recent consultation, and we will act at pace to set out the way forward. This is a genuine debate. You will have seen in the FT uh, this morning uh, that there are different views in relation to reform to the listings uh, review, and it's right and proper that we take some time to consider those and work out a sensible way forward, and we will do that. It also includes broadening access to the long-term asset funds to help investors with the right risk appetite access illiquid assets such as venture capital, private equity, and private debt. It includes working collaboratively with partners in government and other regulators to ensure that people's pensions are transparent, deliver value for money, and can, with the right risk appetite, also 
invest in certain illiquid assets. It's not in my speech, but I do agree with the question that we need a discussion about risk. What is the country risk appetite? What are individuals and businesses risk appetite? Risk is an important part of growing the economy. It also includes creating simple, reliable regime for ESG disclosures, labels, and ratings, which will ensure investors and consumers can make informed decisions as to whether the companies and financial products they're investing in are supporting our societal ambitions and our necessary ambition to green the economy. The thread running through all of these and so many others is that we as a regulator can help the flow of capital and investment by upholding the integrity and international reputation of our markets. The UK was the most attractive destination in Europe for direct foreign investment in the last year, according to an EY report. You wouldn't think that if you read the newspapers. Uh, the UK extended its lead over France, um, which was second place, and attracted 76 financial services projects in 2022. You wouldn't think that if you read the newspapers. We are on the up, but we cannot take and must not take that for granted. To effectively regulate uh, and to drive competitiveness and growth, we must be efficient as a regulator. So our own operational efficiency at the FCA is rightly always under scrutiny. We will continue to increase the use of data, technological and human resources. We speak with many fintechs and finance businesses seeking to do business in the UK. And they say two things to me. First, they want to be authorized here because they know we have a strong and stable system of regulation. Second, they raise concerns about the cost and time it takes to get authorized. We've listened to this feedback. We are tackling our authorizations backlog, reducing it by 60% recently. We're trialing automated forms, which we hope should speed up the process. And our Future of Data Collections program aims to make it more cost effective for firms to supply us with the data we need to do our work. Our focus on efficiency and effectiveness extends to our rulemaking. At the FCA, we're responsible for transferring into UK law nearly 90% of the EU files relating to financial services. We can decide to repeal or replace them with rules better tailored to our needs, to our UK needs. At all times during this mammoth task, we will remain focused on delivering against all our statutory objectives, including how any changes can further growth and competitiveness. We want consumers and markets to capture the benefits these changes will bring while managing the cost regulatory change puts on industry. And ultimately, we want our handbook, which could fill this room, um, and our rules to be as clear as they, can for, as they can be for new entrants and existing players alike. This is a significant opportunity for the UK's financial services sector, for all of us to adapt to the demands of the future and support um, our UK and global markets. And as we take this challenge on, we want to hear from you and we want industry to be involved in shaping that future. We've already worked with firms and with government on replacing our rules in some key areas. Briefly, these are the overhaul of the prospectus regime, targeted change to the securitization regulation, and reconsidering our approach to PRIPS disclosures. You can see from that that together we want to continue to work to create a more competitive, streamlined and proportionate regulatory environment. So how will the public and how will you know that we're doing well on this new secondary objective on competitiveness uh, uh, and growth? As a public body, uh, and certainly I know this personally, uh, we know we need to be accountable for what we do, uh, and we're happy to do that. We are working at speed to embed the enhanced accountability mechanisms included in the bill. We're in the process of setting up a new cost benefits analysis panel, which will advise and scrutinize our methodology for conducting, for conducting CBAs. If there's any chief economists out there who think they want to apply, I'm on the panel, come and have a chat with me. Um, although it will be a proper process, but uh, we, need, <laughs> we need as many of you as possible. Um, we know CBAs are critical in ensuring our rules are proportionate um, and we are using the opportunity the new panel brings to 
became, to become even more rigorous and analytical in measuring the expected effects of our work. That CBA panel has made the economists in the organisation very excited, actually, funnily enough. Uh, we will soon publish our updated rule review framework, which will lay out when and how we will scrutinise if our existing rules are working as intended. We will take a proactive data-led approach to reviewing new rules, and we won't shy away from amending or rescinding them um, if we find they aren't working as intended. And as an outcomes-driven organisation, we already measure and publish our performance against over 80 metrics, such as increasing the proportion of consumers who have confidence and trust in your industry. The government recently called for suggestions for new metrics to measure how we will deliver on this new objective. And I won't say what I think those metrics should be, because that, that wouldn't be fair, would it? Uh, although I do have a list of them. Um, uh, but I will say uh, uh, the types of things, uh, that, how you should form them. You know, proposed metrics need to be relevant and proportionate to our role. Um, they should not create perverse incentives for us. I don't think that would help us or the industry. They should abide by National Audit Office guidelines and they need to be alive to the fact that we do not operate in a vacuum. It is not the FCA, the PRA or the bank alone that can drive the competitiveness and growth of the UK economy. Metrics which are strongly influenced by factors such as wider government policy are unlikely to be a good way of assessing the effectiveness of independent regulation whereas metrics which are specifically linked to our actions, as well as those key drivers of productivity, which promote international growth and competitiveness, are likely to be far more informative and helpful uh, to this task. There are many factors which we do not control when it comes to growth and competitiveness of the economy, such as the geopolitical environment, taxation, investment in infrastructure, immigration, demographics, and many more besides. Firms tell us it is expensive and cumbersome to attract talent from around the world or move talented employees from one jurisdiction to another. FinTechs often tell us that they are not eligible for the EIS tax schemes, a system which encourages investment in a tax-efficient way. And there are many reasons for the behavior of UK investors and why money is held uh, to a greater degree in overseas equity funds than those specialised in homegrown equities. We also have very different powers and remits to some of our international counterparts. These are just a small number of many factors which have an enormous impact on economic competitiveness and growth, which fall outside our remit. But as our CEO, Nicol Rathi, has said recently, we are at the start of a long-awaited debate about the wider markets ecosystem and the role we all play in supporting it. So in conclusion, as the Financial Services and Markets Bill is very close to royal assent, we are well advanced at the FCA in developing how our upcoming uh, objective fits within our existing remit. And we welcome that opportunity to continue to support economic growth. But there is no trade-off. We won't bend our supervisory and enforcement work or distort our rules just to ensure competitiveness at all costs. And I don't think you would expect us to do so. But we will carefully assess and use the secondary competitiveness objective in the light of our primary objectives when we carry out our work. And we will continue, as I've outlined uh, this morning, to play our role in ensuring that we have safe, stable, and effective markets which are innovative and support the flow of capital investment as the UK seeks to drive economic growth for future generations. Thank you very much.